Good morning, everyone. I'm Larry Spraggs. I'm the uh, chair of the uh, board for Lake Placid Institute, and I want to welcome you all here for our, our last roundtable of the season. Um, uh, the Adirondack Roundtable has really become one of LPI's uh, premier programs, and we are proud to provide this kind of uh, opportunity for citizens of the Ap uh, Adirondacks to, um, you know, kind of expand their knowledge on pretty interesting topics. Um, for those of you who might not know, the Lake Placid Institute is a nonprofit organization that was formed in uh, 1994. Uh, the Institute uses the Adirondacks as a model for learning uh, about issues and contributing to their solutions. Uh, we're dedicated to creating an environment to bring people together, to participate in exchanging ideas and of regional, national, and global significance. And our speaker today is going to you know, challenge us on some of those issues uh, before us. Put simply, our, our mission, uh, the mission of the Lake Placid Institute is to create opportunities in the Adirondacks for learning, sharing, and enjoying. So we can't do that, any of that, of course, without the support of a lot of people. And I want to thank all of uh, you that support the Lake Placid Institute through uh, service and, and funding. Uh, we are a nonprofit, uh, and we need everyone's help to continue our efforts. But one of the greatest supporters of the uh, Lake Placid Institute is the Lucy family uh, and the Crown Plaza Hotel. So thank you very much, Carolyn. Uh, they provided this venue for the Adirondack for a number of years, and uh, we've come to really enjoy their hospitality. I'd also want, I want to thank Joel Hand. I, I didn't thank Joel and some of the other, but the guy behind the camera. This, all of our programs are webcast on uh, uh, North Country Public Radio. Um, so anyway, thank you very much to Joel and NPR. <laughs> and I, uh, we just had a, our, our board meeting yesterday. Uh, we have a number of board members, and the number of them here, I'd like you to stand up, please. You deserve a lot of credit for a lot of work, and, and thank you. Um, the two-hour board meeting yesterday was one of those efforts, and I thank you again. Uh, uh, but also, those of you in the audience, uh, if you have any kind of input about the uh, LPI uh, programs, please talk to the board members at your tables. And uh, uh, we're always looking to find out how we can do something more, something better. Uh, and there are survey cards I'm going to remind you before you leave. Uh, and also, you know, in this day and age, and Bruce, our speaker, will probably allude to some of this, but we need your email addresses to keep you in touch with what we're doing. There's a guest book in the back. Please give us your name and your email address, and we can keep you up to date on all the wonderful things that LPI is doing. So please uh, do that. But now, our speaker today um, is Bruce Headlam. Uh, Bruce is the media editor at the New York Times. Uh, he oversees uh, the paper's coverage of publishing newspapers, television, uh, new media, and Hollywood. Uh, he, he grew up in Elmira, Ontario, just a small town of 4,000 people, but there were two papers there, as he said, uh, two competing papers, which is kind of like, like Placid, isn't it, uh, with our various papers. Um, he spent a decade in Toronto working uh, for magazines like Saturday Night and Canadian Business. And my dear friend Ruth uh, uh, Hart, I just was talking to her. She says, I used to write an article for Canadian Business many, many years ago, but uh, that's wonderful. Um, anyway, um, he's also, um, where, where, you know, when he was at those magazines, he was writing on topics like art, books, and the environment. Uh, he came to New York in 1998. Um, and to launch a technology section for the New York Times uh, and has been with the paper ever since um, in a variety of roles, but now the media desk since, since 2008. Um, Bruce was featured in a full-length documentary called Page One, A Year Inside the New York Times, which follows media reporters as they do their uh, jobs and following the upheavals of a lot of things that have happened uh, in, the, in their own industry, things like you know WikiLeaks and the rise of web journalism uh, and you know which is really uh, kind of a contradiction to supporting the traditions of uh, well it's a different kind of journalism and that's what Bruce would like to talk about today so 
Uh, his presentation is called Turning the Page, What's Next for the New York Times? Sir Bruce Headlam. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, it's very nice to see all of you. I gather uh, in part I'm being judged by the gate, so I hope this is a healthy room. I realize I won't uh, probably attract the most people here, but it's very important for me that I beat Gretchen Morgenson, my colleague at the New York Times. So, um, Two notes of caution before I start. One, I have a cold, as you can tell, so there might be a few small coughing fits. I'll be all right. Uh, secondly, uh, this is only my second uh, trip to Lake Placid, and I have to confess that I don't ski, or I don't mountain climb, I don't sail, I don't speed skate, uh, skeet shoot, luge, or whatever else it is you people uh, do around here, uh, but I have a very intense personal connection, which is that I am engaged to Mayor Miller's niece, Stephanie, and we are getting married in seven weeks. Uh, and since I proposed uh, last December, yes? Okay. A little better? Now, you'll be able to hear me coughing much better now when I... Uh, since I proposed last December, I've done my best to fit in with her extended family. Uh, I now own a pair of khaki shorts. Uh, I have something called topsiders you might be familiar with. And uh, I'm seriously looking at a cable knit sweater from the L.L. Bean catalog. Um, so if you'll bear with me in the meanwhile, uh, I'll do my best to fit in. Uh, years ago, Linda Greenhouse, <coughs> pardon me, uh, who's the famous New York Times Supreme Court reporter, uh, was photographed taking part in a pro-choice rally in Washington, uh, and her picture appeared in various newspapers. Uh, this led to a lot of criticism of our paper. Uh, we're supposed to be unbiased, and how could it be that Linda could fairly cover a debate as polarizing as abortion when she clearly had very strong issues on one side? It led to the Times' current policy that we're not allowed to, uh, the reporters there, are not allowed to uh, join political organizations, attend rallies, or even have bumper stickers or a, a t-shirt with a featuring a candidate. Around the same time, a friend of mine, uh, who's a reporter at the Washington Post, was at a symposium at the Columbia Journalism School, and he was asked by a student there whether Post reporters should be allowed to attend pro-choice rallies. Um, he said no, not because it would violate uh, their neutrality, but because if everybody who wanted to attend a pro-choice rally at the Washington Post could attend a pro-choice rally, there'd be nobody left to put out the newspaper. Um, he thought this was absolutely hilarious. Uh, unfortunately, when his remarks appeared later in the Columbia Journalism Review, uh, his bosses didn't think they were quite so funny. This is my very long-winded way of saying that if anybody is writing up the speech or tweeting it or blogging it or tumbling it or storifying it, uh, let me know now. I hope to be uh, candid, and I hope to be lively, but uh, if this is going to be broadly reported, I I would like to sort of raise my personal threat level to uh, Amber. Thanks very much. Uh, I became a journalist about 20 years ago, uh, not for the reason many be people uh, nowadays become journalists, because they want to have influence. I was broke, which is a very old-fashioned way of becoming a journalist. Uh, and I stayed in journalism rather than moving on to novel writing or memoirs or some other kind of writing. Uh, because I always said I was much more interested in the world than I was in myself. About five years ago, I was made the editor of the Monday Business section, which is dedicated to media, including covering the New York Times itself. I now run 12 reporters that cover the media, and uh, as was said, I am uh, featured in a documentary about the New York Times, and we're going to see a few little clips from that later. Uh, so uh, 20 years later, here I am talking about my own business, my own employer, and basically myself, the one subject I became a journalist to avoid. Uh, how did this become actually interesting to anybody? Uh, well, I'll give credit to Andrew Rossi, who's the filmmaker who made page one. Uh, I didn't understand why anybody would want to read about the New York Times. Uh, to me, uh, it, when you're reading the paper, you should be concerned about what's in the paper, not what's behind the paper, any more than you should be concerned about the electrical grid while you're making toast in the morning. But Almost on cue, as Andrew started filming, uh, things got very, very uh, frantic at the New York Times. Our earnings cratered. Our company was forced into a lease buyback of our its own headquarters, meaning we're essentially renters in the building we own. Uh, so we have a fair bit of sympathy for the 
large part of this country that's uh, underwater in their own mortgages. We had to borrow money from Carlos Slim, the Mexican billionaire, at 14%. I can't imagine too many people here are paying 14% on their mortgages currently. Uh, we had layoffs for the first time in memory, buyouts, and just for good measure, our executive editor was publicly accused of treason for publishing, publishing uh, diplomatic cables uh, in cooperation with WikiLeaks. There was widespread speculation that the Times would go bankrupt. The precise date was May 2009, was the prediction. Uh, now, that date came and went, uh, but like many of those sort of doomsday dates that come and go, uh, it doesn't give you... Uh, it doesn't ease the nagging worry that next time the doomsayers might be right. Suddenly a lot of people were saying we were going out of business, and perhaps what surprised us more, there were a lot of people, and not just the usual suspects, saying good riddance. So how exactly did this happen, not just to the Times, but to newspapers in general? And what does it mean for people like you, who are civic-minded people, who care about the world, who want to participate in the political process, and want to stay informed, whether or not you like the New York Times, uh, and if you don't like the Times, don't feel bad. Many days I share your, uh, I share your feelings. Uh, but you probably rely on some measure on the Times or NBC News or the Wall Street Journal or the Buffalo News or the Adirondack Enterprise to keep you up to date on what's happening in your world. Um, there's a short answer, and it neatly explains why the big news this week in business was that Steve Jobs was stepping down, and that's the Internet. In the past 15 years, people have flocked to get their news from the Internet. There's been a massive shift in our business. Uh, but the real answer, I think, is a little more complicated, a lot bigger, and I think a lot more interesting. When I arrived at the Times in 1998, the company was probably worth about $4 billion on the market. Uh, the company depended heavily on advertising, and business was good. Tiffany's, if you, if you read the New York Times every day, you'll notice has an ad on the top right corner of page 3. It has for over 100 years. Uh, and it was joined by a lot of other luxury advertisers, car companies, all of which loved the Times audience and wanted to be in front of them every day. The company's total revenue that year was probably around $3.7 billion. That's in current dollars. Fast forward 13 years. We're about a $1.5 billion company. Our revenue has dropped by about 40%. We bought the Boston Globe, a great paper in one of the most interesting, vibrant cities, not just in North America, but in the world. And we've pretty much written off the entire value of that purchase. Uh, the IHT, the International Herald Tribune, which we uh, bought outright a couple of years ago, doesn't make any money, or at least not very much money. Tiffany's is still on page three, but lots of other advertisers have left. Uh, and that happened even before the current recession hit. And in the media business, we're not alone. When Comcast, uh, the cable giant, bought NBC Universal a couple of years ago, uh, that's the company that includes NBC, which you know, the, the channel, many cable networks, and the Universal Film Studios for just under $14 billion. Uh, one of my reporters found out that Comcast valued NBC itself, the network, at zero. When you think about it, that's pretty amazing. NBC was the first great television network. It's the home of Seinfeld, Friends, ER, Law & Order, although they canceled Law & Order for reasons I still don't understand. Uh, but that network was essentially considered worthless. Around the same time, EMI, legendary music label, the home to the Beatles, has been passed from investor to investor, most recently to a private equity manager who made most of his money renovating roadside toilets on the Autobahn. Now, there are many people that will tell you this is the inevitable result of the Internet, that people have new choices, that they don't rely on old institutions for their news and entertainment, and that's a kind of technological determinism. This is just what happens to the world. Uh, just as happened to horses and buggies when the car came along. Uh, NBC might be, but there's actually much more to how people consume news. And if you look carefully, a different picture emerges. For example, NBC might be considered uh, worthless, and it's true that fewer people watch network TV. But that's not because of the Internet. In fact, people now watch more TV than at any time in history. The average American watches about 150 hours a month, according to Nielsen. Um, that hasn't gone down. The competition isn't from the Internet. It's from some of NBC's uh, own networks like Bravo and MTV and, of course, Fox News. Even at the New York Times, our finances might be very, very shaky, but business is booming. We now reach 20 million individual readers every month through our website, an incredible number that past generations of legendary reporters and editors couldn't have dreamed of. 
we not only give them a full account of what's in the newspaper every day, we give them incredible multimedia features like the Hurricane Irene uh, uh, tracker, which we're all looking at very anxiously as they, as they actually evacuate parts of my city, New York. Uh, we have dozens of blogs, hundreds of videos every month. We're not the roadkill on the internet superhighway. In fact, we're in the lead. So what happened to all the money? Well, the money that allowed NBC to have a full news crew in Baghdad and Afghanistan and to have a full crew in Japan, which it didn't have when the tsunami hit a few months ago. The money that allowed music companies to sign new bands and look for the next Beatles. The money that allowed the New York Times to have bureaus around the world, including in my native Canada, which is now covered by a single freelancer in Ottawa. Uh, not to worry. Uh, it's not like we're the U.S.'s leading trading partner or anything. The money didn't just evaporate. It changed addresses. Google has a market cap of $170 billion. And while we think of Google as being a technology company, essentially what it is is the world's biggest ad placement firm built on those little ads that run alongside the text on the web and if you use Gmail on your email. A part of what Google sells, of course, is news from all kinds of sources, including the New York Times. Google's subsidiary YouTube contains millions of hours of programming, most of it made by media companies, but available anytime to anyone for free. And the money went to Apple, which was briefly the most valuable company in the world, built on devices like the iPod and the iPad that make our media instantly available, even to people who don't want to pay for it. Or on a smaller level, and I'm sure there's some people here who read the Huffington Post, the Huffington Post was recently purchased for $300 million, mainly in cash, because Arianna Huffington's no fool. Uh, but that value was largely built on free labor from contributors and from aggregation, which means they take content from the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Post, give it a different, sexier headline and a link to the original article, and then sell their own ads against it. To give you a very small example, one of my reporters had a small news item about NBC. It was in the middle of the Jay Leno, sort of Conan O'Brien mess a year or two back. So we put it up on the website. Not a long item, maybe 300 words. Within minutes, Huffington Post had an almost identical item. Uh, with a small link to the original, although no actual credit to the New York Times. Theirs was around 250 words. So let's look at the costs. My reporter, Bill Carter, is a professional with 30 years of experience in journalism. He's probably the best TV reporter on the planet. He has spent all his career exhaustively reporting out his beat, getting to know the people that will help him break even the small stories of 300 words. Most of that career has been spent at the Times. We pay a salary, not a huge salary, but a salary nonetheless, his benefits, provide him with retirement savings, colleagues, editors, and the rest of the infrastructure needed for his job. To match our story, the Huffington Post needed a freelancer, probably paid around one-third of what Bill makes, to watch our website, quickly retype the item to avoid any obvious problems with copyright. And because the Huffington Post is an aggregator, lots of people go there for all kinds of news. I don't know the numbers, but I'm guessing very few of those people actually went back to the New York Times or gave us any credit whatsoever, and we certainly didn't sell any ads across against uh, our own work. So what does that mean for the Times in the long run, that we're competing with our own work? I'd like to show you a little clip from page one, uh, starting now. The scene isn't actually shot by the filmmaker. It's a little confusing. Uh, this was taken from a telev televised symposium on the media and uh, the sort of slightly dangerous homeless looking guy is in fact my media columnist David Carr. I'm prepared to act out all the roles if necessary. It's a problem.
um, an informed citizenry is what this nation is about uh, is self-serving. The New York Times is a good newspaper sometimes. The Washington Post is a good newspaper. The LA Times, before it became a bad newspaper, was a good newspaper. <laughs> but after that, it's <clears throat> off the cliff. It's oblivion. <clears throat> the news business in this country is nothing to be proud of. The media is a technology business. That's what it is. That's what it has always been. Technology changes, the media changes. Over time, the audience has switched to the web. The audience that's worth a buck in print is worth a dime and sometimes a penny on the web. Because we end up competing oftentimes against our own work aggregated. Newsers is a great looking site, you might want to check it out. Aggregates all manner of content. But I wonder if Michael's really thought to get rid of mainstream media content. Okay. Go ahead. Um, for obvious reasons, I like watching that scene over and over again. Uh, I always enjoy getting Michael Wolff, uh, embarrassing him. Uh, at any rate, the theory behind a lot of aggregation and what a lot of the sort of new media uh, thinkers believe uh, is the idea that information wants to be free. It's a phrase you've all heard. Uh, it's become a kind of article of faith of business today. You hear it on ads. You hear it everywhere. Um, I think when most people quote it, uh, they don't realize they're actually quoting uh, a person, Stuart Brand. Uh, Stuart Brand was a kind of hippie, hacker, California type. He was a good friend of Ken Kesey's. Um, and he's probably best known for creating the Whole Earth Catalog, if you remember that. Uh, but it's funny, when people quote uh, Stuart Brand talking about information being free, they don't use the whole quote. And this is the whole quote. On the one hand, he said, information wants to be expensive because it's so valuable. The right information in the right place just changes your life. On the other hand, information wants to be free because of the cost of getting it out is getting lower and lower all the time. So you have these two fighting against each other. Now you'll notice when Stuart Brand is talking about the price of getting uh, out information, he's talking about distribution. And he's right, that is getting cheaper. And the internet has been a huge boon in that regard. He wasn't talking about the price of getting information in the first place. And I can tell you that that is still very, very expensive. And if you don't think it's expensive, I have a New York Times compound in downtown Baghdad to sell you, complete with a security barrier, armored cars, and a security task force. So while there's very little barrier to distributing information for companies like Newser, for Huffington Post, it still costs money to make it. And that may explain why, despite the promise of things like citizen journalism, of crowdsourcing, all wonderful tools, uh, to produce media that have been democratized or are now in the hands of virtually everybody, when it comes to news, to the heavy lifting of gathering, sifting, sorting, editing, and prioritizing news, it's still being done largely by professionals in the mainstream media. A recent study out of Baltimore found that 95% of the news there on the local blogs was first reported by traditional media, newspapers, television stations, and then essentially reprinted online. And it's not just journalism. Despite the millions of videos of skateboarding bulldogs and kittens falling asleep on YouTube, a vast percentage of what actually sells on YouTube, uh, the kind of content that Google can sell ads against and make money, is professional videos from film and television. And despite the promise that the next generation of television stars will come from homemade video, there hasn't been a performer, a franchise, or an online channel worth a fraction of a single television hit like C CSI, which is worth around a billion dollars to CBS. A great deal of the reliable information on Twitter is generated first by news media, then passed on millions and millions of times. Even a monumental project like Wikipedia, uh, and I differ slightly from my colleagues in the New York Times who are deeply suspicious of Wikipedia, I think Wikipedia is one of the great creations of mankind, a vast online encyclopedia that is far more accurate than people give it credit for. But it owes a lot of its credibility to being built on reliable sources like academic institutions and newspapers. Uh, those do the original work, and Wikipedia is, yes, built by citizens, 
but it requires citations for all its facts. So while the money may have shifted to Silicon Valley, to Google and Apple and Facebook, a lot of the actual creation of work, of news, of music, entertainment, as David showed, is still being done the old-fashioned way. So if it sounds like I'm poo-pooing the digital generation and the digital revolution, I'm not. Uh, it hasn't just altered the way money is distributed, sadly away from my employer, but it's changed our relationship to our audience. In the old days, if a reader didn't like what the Times had written, he might sit down, write a letter to the editor, address the envelope, buy a stamp, and put it in the mailbox. A couple days later, the letter would be received by our massive mailroom, and if it even found its way to the right desk and the reader had a legitimate point, it might be included in the letters page. Or if we made an easily identified error, there might, and I repeat, might be a correction within a week or so. And I should add that we had a informal rule, which is if there's any writing on the outside of the envelope, you threw it out immediately. <laughs> Today, the response from readers and from those we write about is instant. Most of what goes into the paper is posted online first, and almost every day a reporter will tell me that a reader, source, or interested party has seen what's going to be in the next day's paper and has demanded a change. I think the watershed moment for the change in this kind of relationship was Memogate. This was, if you recall, in 2004, CBS News, uh, it was 60 Minutes 2, and Dan Rather hosted a report that presented some evidence that George Bush had ducked out of some of his National Guard service thanks to some powerful family connections. Soon after the report, bloggers began to ask questions about the evidence, the timeline, and even the origin of the letter excusing Bush from continued service. Even the font size and the pagination came under attack, and the bloggers made a pretty convincing counterargument that the document, which is supposedly written in the late 60s, had been forged, probably on a computer running a very particular of Word, a very particular version of Word, pardon me, that would have produced the line breaks necessary in the document. CBS fired two producers responsible for the report, ordered up an internal investigation, and pretty much ended Dan Rather's career at CBS. It shook the credibility of the mainstream media, gave a huge impetus to bloggers and online critics who would hammer the old media for its assumptions and its ways of doing things. In a very real way, I think what's under attack is the whole idea of expertise, that journalists have specialized knowledge, specialized skills, and they alone should make the decisions of what gets aired. And in that way, we're not so different than other professionals, from doctors, from lawyers, from academics, who find that consumers, readers, their patients, are armed in a new way because of the internet, and who find themselves as professionals under scrutiny like never before. When I worked in magazines in the 1990s, and was dealing with a nervous or blocked writer, which happened almost every day, I'd say to them, look, you're having trouble finishing this piece because you think the day after it's published there's going to be some sort of panel on public television where they rip apart your article and expose you as a fraud. That's just not going to happen. I would always tell them that and invariably they would feel better and finish their stories. I can't say that anymore because in a very real way that's precisely what happens to our journalists every day. On balance, is it a good thing? Yes, we're obliged to be more accurate. But it also takes a toll on reporters who feel constantly attacked and makes them feel gun-shy about reporting important stories. If you're too reckless, you risk becoming Judy Miller. If you're too cautious, you risk publishing not at all. This brings us, of course, to one of the most important stories in journalism in the past decade or so, and something that I think really altered the relationship between sources, between readers, and between the media, and that's WikiLeaks. Um, WikiLeaks, which we were covering for quite some time, uh, is a basically a hacker organization run by Julian Assange, himself a former hacker, uh, who believes, like many hackers do, that the inner workings of society, like the inner workings of a computer, should be available to everyone. Uh, it really established itself largely in Britain, uh, which has much different privacy laws, and was able to crack open British courts and police secrets uh, in a way that really threatened, threatened the way uh, that Britain likes looking at privacy and uh, likes pursuing it in the courts. Uh, then, in 2009, WikiLeaks took another very big step for the organization. I'd like to show that clip now.
but it turns out there were two lawyers, employees, and then some other unknown people. WikiLeaks somehow, an anonymous source, gets the video and puts it on YouTube. It felt like a possible front page story uh, to, to Bruce and I. So now, basically, the assignment for the rest of the day is to keep the story interesting to editors. We're trying to do a front page story on what this means and what this means for journalism. I mean, clearly, it's great for journalists in some ways because then it's out there. This is a collision of two worlds. Closed old world of expertise and you know, classification and information and privacy, and this new world just kind of wants to crack it all up. You know, we see it ourselves. We're a perfect example of a kind of culture that, you know, is having what we do completely ripped open. Um, so it's. Hey, did you send it? Hey, yeah, I got it. I got it. Yeah, thanks. Bye. You know, this is. These are people watching people get killed in an incredibly graphic way in a war and hearing the reactions of the soldiers. I should add that that makes my work day look much more exciting than it actually is. There's a gripping scene of me eating lunch at my desk just after that. Um, so the question we faced at the time was this. If WikiLeaks had valuable information and it has instant access to millions of readers, it doesn't need trucks, it doesn't need printing plants, it doesn't need uh, the traditional apparatus of the news media, then who really needs the New York Times? In the early 1970s, Daniel Ellsberg went to the Times and to the Washington Post to publish the Pentagon Papers, which was a secret account of how the war in Vietnam was prosecuted. And we published it over the opposition of the White House. But the internet didn't exist then. We were intermediaries of a sort between holders of information and our readers. But with the internet now, who needs the middleman? Well, as it turned out, WikiLeaks did. A year after the Baghdad video, WikiLeaks went to four media organizations, the Times, Der Spiegel, The Observer, and Le Monde, and said they were in possession of a vast store of diplomatic cables that would rip the lid off how the U.S. had been conducting foreign policy across the globe in the past decade. So the four papers essentially went into partnership with WikiLeaks. Partnership, by the way, is my word. Uh, my boss is up and down the masthead would deny it was a partnership. But regardless, we published dozens of stories, including front page stories for nine days in a row, about the revelations in the cable. Cables, pardon me. Now, you can certainly question the value of some of the information in the cables. It shouldn't have come to anybody's surprise that the U.S. didn't trust Vladimir Pu Putin, I'm sure including Vladimir Putin. Uh, on the second day, uh, we ran a story saying that diplomatic cables revealed that Canadians find Americans difficult to deal with, overbearing, and a little arrogant. My response to that was, you didn't need diplomatic cables to find that out. You could have just asked me. But I don't think we should underestimate just what the partnership with WikiLeaks meant. Even Daniel Ellsberg, when I had a reporter call him, admitted that the Times and the Post were necessary for people to really, what was un to really understand what was in the Pentagon Papers. Publication alone wasn't enough. He needed journalists to explain the context, to go back to the original parties, and demand answers to nagging questions. And in the end, so did Julian Assange and WikiLeaks. And as uncomfortable as that relationship was, uh, and it was very hotly debated inside the New York Times, it did at least establish part of the value journalists bring, even in an internet age. The WikiLeaks episode brings us to the final point I want to make, one I hope to make before my uh, voice goes down another octave, uh, one that's not covered in the page one documentary, and one that makes people inside the media particularly nervous. As you saw, WikiLeaks sees themselves as activists for particular political philosophy. That's what made becoming partners with them so fraught, because to work at the Times, at least in the news pages, as opposed to the opinion pages, is to believe that we're not partisans, we're not activists in any ways. We're journalists, which means we're obligated to look at both sides, at all sides of every issue. 
Now, we've always had our critics at the New York Times. People on the right traditionally have accused us of being liberal elitists who always agitate for more government spending, who believe that we focus on the shortcomings of the country, who believe that we're insufficiently deferential to religion and we're too soft in support of Israel. Critics on the left traditionally believe that we're too much in the pockets of the rich and powerful, that we're too much a part of the establishment, that we're too reliant on our advertisers, and that we helped rally this country to fight the war in Iraq, and that we're insufficiently supportive of the Palestinian cause. Now, that kind of criticism comes with a job, and we really shouldn't complain about it. But to my mind, there's been another ascendant strain of media criticism in the past 20 years. The idea that the very pursuit of objective journalism is fatally flawed. This school of criticism says that journalists can't escape their own political and their own personal biases while doing their job, and therefore their job isn't really worth doing at all. In that worldview, everything produced by the New York Times is necessarily mamby-pamby, liberal hash, because of who produces it. And by the same token, everything produced by the Wall Street Journal is a sop to business because it's produced by market-driven Darwinists. I think this idea has come into fashion for many reasons, uh, some of them regulatory reasons, the end of the fairness doctrine in the early 80s, or early 90s, pardon me. Um, but it's certainly one that's very congruent with highly politicized times. A few years, some anthropologists from Microsoft visited our offices, and they showed us mapping of online communities, and they would show how various communities, how intense they were, how re they related to one another, people who like old cars, kids talking about school. The one very striking slide, the one that was different from the rest, uh, was people talking about politics online. You saw very intense areas of interest with virtually no connection between the two. Uh, this would be a very familiar phenomenon to any of you who have ever toggled between MSNBC and Fox News. I think the Times can weather the financial channels, challenges it faces. I think the new relationship we've forged with our readers will be helpful in the long run even if it seems very destructive in the short run. I love the opportunities the internet presents for the paper. But I do worry about a country and a political culture where there are two sides to every debate, your side and the other side, and there's not only no ground in the middle, there's no belief that there is ground in the middle, that every fact, every assertion is judged on whether it's good or bad for your side. To me, one of the great hallmarks of American journalism, of American culture more broadly, is the belief in the pursuit of objective truth, and that's rarer around the world than you might think. It's certainly not part of the British press tradition. Uh, Americans didn't invent it, uh, but I think it's one of the glories of their system. Can journalists really escape their biases, or are we as doomed as Bill O'Reilly and Keith Overman uh, suggest? I don't know. Uh, just like I don't know if I really believe that completely that objective journalism is possible, to me it's a little like love. Maybe it isn't possible, but the pursuit of it is itself a great value. There's a terrific line by Gay Talese from his book, The Kingdom of the Power, which is written about the Times, and it's quoted in the movie. He was talking about the senior editors of the Times in the 60s, and he said they were flawed men, but he said it was equally true that they almost always tried to be fair. When we're not fair, for example, in the run-up to the Iraq War, it's not because, as many people think, because we're all secretly neocons, or we're in favor of the Bush government, or because Judy Miller was too close to her sources. All those could be true, of course. But really the reason was because the whole journalistic enterprise of questioning everything, including your own sources, didn't work. We didn't do our job of asking the dumb questions, of challenging every assumption, of getting past our own biases, and this is where the speech really comes full circle. We were guilty of not getting past ourselves. And that's really the challenge that faces journalists every day, and despite what you think, uh, that's still very important to the news, wherever you might read it. So if the Times and every other newspaper in this country deserves to survive, it's because it's going to perform that simple task without fail every day. Maybe the money will keep going to Google and Apple and Arianna Huffington, and I'm sure it won't satisfy any of our mo vocal critics, but at least we'll be doing our job. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now I think we have, before my voice vanishes altogether, um, I'd like to hear some of your voices. We have some questions. Um, I'm trying to avoid everyone from Stephanie's extended family, but it's <laughs> seemingly I can't. Uh, so I'll ask Mara for. Um, where do you think the partnership with WikiLeaks and Assange, is it 
now broken? Uh, the relationship with the Times was completely broken uh, because we reported very aggressively about some of his own problems. As you know, he has not been charged with a crime in Sweden, uh, but he has been accused of a crime in Sweden. Uh, and he did not like our coverage of that. Uh, WikiLeaks most recently partnered with The Nation. They did some stories about Haiti that were very interesting. But The Nation is a very small publication, and it did not certainly get the kind of play uh, or the kind of airing that it did when he uh, cooperated with the other newspapers. I, 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 I need another table to step oh, up. Here. All right. How, how is your uh, How is your internet model work? I love your website. How is it working in terms of revenue? Uh, as you might know, we decided a little while ago to institute a paywall. Uh, now it's a soft paywall. We call it a metered model, which means uh, you get 20 articles for free every month, and after that, you have to start paying. Now that's an acknowledgement that for a lot of our readers, they only come less than 20 times a month. But we have a solid core of about 3 million people who come constantly to our website. And it's almost like a, a, a PBS model. It's like a, you know, you go to your more, your most intense consumers and say, you know, we would like you to pay. Um, although we don't have to do the doo-wop specials and everything else that PBS has to do. Uh, it is, well, it's, doing much better than expected, uh, or it's exceeding expectations. I think it was very smartly done. I don't think it was well marketed, but I think it was very smartly executed. I think it's, uh, I don't remember, over 200,000, well over 200,000 at this point, which is ahead of schedule. Uh, but bear in mind that uh, even at its most optimistic, that's going to be maybe $60 million a year, uh, which is not a deal breaker or a deal maker, pardon me. It's not going to save the company. Its failure is not going to doom the company. Um, the fact is most of our revenue, about 75% of our revenue, still comes from the printed paper. Yes. Thank God, Anon. She's actually related. Oh. All right. But, uh, this will tell you where, where, where I stand and where I sit. but. I'm increasingly alarmed by the intersection, the impact that the Fox News Corp has in what I consider being an arm, an extended arm of the conservative wing of the Republican Party and all that that entails, and how it has injected itself into political thought and dialogue in this country. And I don't know whether this is something different in in magnitude, whether we've always had, through other forms of media, this kind of uh, situation, but what it bodes for the future of politics and um, discourse, and even the elections in this country. And, and I'd just like your take on that. Well, there, there has always been partisan media, even in the United States. Um, what I talked about, the sort of cult of objectivity, is a, is a fairly recent phenomenon. Uh, so there's always been newspapers on one side or the other. Fox News really emerged out of talk radio. And talk radio came about in the 90s because uh, there used to be something called the Fairness Doctrine in the United States, which means if you had a liberal on your show, you had to give equal time to a uh, conservative. And that was ended, I, I can't remember the precise date, uh, under the first Bush or Reagan, I can't remember. Uh, and that is what led to, led to the rise of things like Rush Limbaugh, which were uh, very unapologetically conservative and incredibly popular, and by the way, incredibly lucrative. There's a huge radio empire built out of those shows. What Fox did was essentially take that and move it to cable television. Uh, and on cab cable is not uh, governed by government regulation. The FCC doesn't, uh, doesn't uh, regulate cable, and so they can do pretty much what they want. I, I would say this, uh, and I deal with Fox uh, quite a bit, and it's often a very difficult relationship because we uh, we cover them, uh, and they're enormously successful. Uh, you've been reading about Rupert Murdoch and his troubles in England. The fact is, Rupert Murdoch could close every paper he owns, including the Wall Street Journal, and his company would be about 85% of what it is right now. Half the profit at News Corp now, which is a massive corporation, is driven by its cable channels, largely by Fox. It's enormously successful. Uh, to me, the most interesting thing Fox has done, and this gets at what I spoke about, is not to simply present a conservative side. Uh, the great genius to me of the phrase fair and balanced, which is what they've always called themselves, is not that anybody thinks that Fox is fair and balanced. What it really is, 
is the accusation that nobody is fair and balanced, that they're presenting one side because the other side was always presented throughout media. Um, so there's a certain kind of, I think, cynicism that engenders about truth, about what you can find out, and I think it contributes to this idea that people increasingly uh, want to listen to things that confirm their political opinions as opposed to challenge their political opinions. But as a business, and I do cover business, it's been incredibly successful. Yes? I'm uh, Kathy Moore. I'm publisher of the Adirondack Daily Enterprise oh, nice. and the Lake nice Placid News. And um, our newspapers are total free content on the web. And I guess we're all wondering about the future because everybody feels that it's always going to be free and they expect it. And uh, as you said, you know, you get more money in print. And we've doubled the amount of our readers uh, online and in print. But we're kind of watching the big boys. And I, mm -hmm. I know I've spoke to people from the Times that say they still have a uh, research and development that is strong in print in the future down the road. So you still believe you'll be just as strong as in print. But I've spoken to people at Google saying, no, newspapers are, have to probably go the way of, of NPR and, and get just uh, sponsorship or have a foundation to pay for the, the news mm -hmm. gathering. Um, do you think, how do you think the online, uh, well, everybody is looking at the New York Times and their paywall right. and see how it works and then we'll all follow suit. But the sad thing is, is um, there's over 800 small community papers in, in New York and when you get them in a room and you say, who's making money on the web? There's only one that raises their hand, which is scary. Um, so how do you see, do you think everybody will follow suit and, and, and pay for content on the web in the future? Uh, I'm far from an expert on community newspapers. I would say the idea that everything must be given away for free was a kind of tenant of early internet businesses. Uh, you know, around the same time Pets.com was trying to send you dog food with free shipping. Um, nobody does that anymore, but for some reason we still believe passionately that everything must be given away or we're going to lose our audience, which I think is a, a sort of uh, odd proposition at best. Newspapers used to be local monopolies. Um, they owned a lot of the information in a community. And I don't think newspapers have probably capitalized on a lot of that information and given, and you know, in terms of listings and what you can give people. Um, but the idea that uh, you can give away everything for free and then still expect them to pick up a newspaper seems a very odd proposition. Now, had online advertising worked out, uh, we'd be in a very different world. But the fact is, uh, the reason Tiffany's pays us so much is because there's only one page three in the New York Times and they know what that placement is, and they know what they're across from, and they know that readers will find them. There's no scarcity on the web. There's millions and millions of websites. And if there's no scarcity, that means the price goes down. And what people thought they were going to get for online advertising, the dollars they thought they were going to see, they simply never materialized. Uh, so I, I don't know if the metered model is going to work for everyone. I think the challenge for community papers is the same as ours. We probably have an advantage because of our profile, but you're going to have to give people something they want to pay for. And except for the past 10 years, information has never actually been free. And I think we have to convince readers we've got something they're worth, that's worth paying for. Yes? Um, if a, a person wanted to go into journalism, these days, a young person. Mm -hmm. Where would you tell them? What would you tell them to do to get the skills? I've been, been wondering this lately. Uh, because I came up through magazines, uh, I would always tell people <clears throat> they should write for magazines and newspapers. Newspapers teaches you not to be afraid of the page. Newspapers teach you, pardon me, not to be afraid of the page. Or grammar, apparently. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, magazine articles, long-form journalism teaches you about structure, it teaches you about character, it teaches you how to write. Uh, I can't say that I wouldn't tell someone now that they have to know video and they have to be able to blog and do many, many other things. I would play down the blogging part. I think a lot of uh, young journalists today think they have to build a brand for themselves and some of them have, have been 
um, the young man you saw reporting WikiLeaks, he was 23 at the time, he had started a blog uh, when he was at college called TV Newser, uh, which became very popular. He was anonymous. We need people like Brian Williams like giving him tips on the side, not realizing he was a 20-year-old at Towson University outside Baltimore. Uh, and we hired him, and he's been, he's really quite incredible. He's, he's covering the hurricane right now uh, in North Carolina. Um, you know, so he has a set of skills I don't really understand. And he may be an example of someone who had a, who had a, a personal brand, and that's why we hired him. I tend to shy away from that. Um, I still think writing skill and critical skills, being able to think and report, are the most important uh, attributes anybody can get. And I think if you're spending too much time on Tumblr, you're not going to develop those. Yes? In light of reduced revenues for print media, I mean, I can remember where the Times had news bureaus in every major capital in the world, and even in some non-major capitals are, you know, all over the world. Mm -hmm. How are you going to keep enough feet on the ground to get the primary sources of news that, that you depend on? Uh, we have fewer bureaus. We are probably much better at sending people into trouble. Now, it's not, it's not ideal that someone who hasn't been covering Syria has to go into Syria and figure it out, but it's required a level of expertise on the part of our journalists that they probably didn't have before. They need to adjust much more quickly to the environment and to the climate. David Kirkpatrick, who's been covering um, uh, many of the Arab Spring uprisings he used to cover media. I used to work with him. Tim Arango, who's the Baghdad bureau chief, was my corporate media reporter. Uh, and I just think it requires a kind of more, um, you know, to, to sort of steal a, a military term, we're kind of a rapid deployment force at this point. We send people where there's trouble. It's not the same kind of journalism, uh, but it seems to be working so far. How far you can stretch people, though, is a good question, and I don't think I don't think we've quite hit that point, but we will. Yes. What do you? What do you? What's the Times um, policy currently on this on the plagi plagiarism issue where people are stealing your? Uh... Well, it's not really considered stealing; it's considered fair use. Now, we could go after the Huffington Post for an individual article, but uh, one of the vexing things about fair use, which is very important in this country, I'm not, I'm not dismissing it, but it is done on a case-by-case -case basis. And, uh, you know, for the number of people who kind of take our stuff without attribution and use it, there's really not enough lawyers in the world to go after them all. Uh, possibly there are enough lawyers in the world, but we certainly can't afford to hire that number of lawyers. <clears throat> um, uh, it's interesting, the, the documentary that was done about us called uh, Page One, it had a little tagline at the end, uh, and the tagline was, consider the source. And you hope in the long run that if people see that enough information was coming to the New York Times for our business interests, that eventually they will say, well, then I'll go to the New York Times. Now, that puts a huge burden on us. It means we have to produce better work than everybody else. Um, we have to kind of earn that trust. We'll see. Yes. It seems like our world is uh, evolving to a point where everyone is a reporter, everyone has a video camera, but as a civic-minded person, we don't know what's true. You know, although to some extent we can watch a film and see, well, okay, that little piece that we just saw looked like it's true, but we have to rely on folks like the Times to comment, to analyze, to bring together bright minds, to tell us to some extent, okay, these are things that are real out there in the world. And if your profit model can't in the long run, base itself on that, uh, there can't be too much hope for, for journalism in, in your sense. Uh, probably not. I mean, I think there's a way to go where, you know, we've, we've cut a lot, we've cut back here and there. Um, I'm not so pessimistic that we'll be out of business. I may be slightly more pessimistic than some of the people I work with. Um, but you're absolutely true. Uh, you know, recently there's been that uh, uh, conservative blogger James O'Keefe, who's been trying to capture, uh, he's been trying to catch uh, NPR and Acorn and different groups in embarrassing situations. Uh, and one of the things you need to do is to be able to sort of pull that apart and say how these people were provoked. And, uh, and often it's not quickly enough to save their political lives, but at least it gets the truth of what actually happened out there. But that's a time-consuming process. And you're right, everybody's got a video camera now. Uh, and it puts people, 
including public figures under an incredible scrutiny. Helen Thomas, who's a reporter, a longtime reporter, lost her job because she didn't realize she was being recorded when she said something uh, terribly unkind about Israel. Uh, Barack Obama, during the last election, was caught by a conservative blogger saying uh, the Americans feel afraid and are relying on uh, whatever it was, guns and God, I can't remember. Um, he didn't think he was being taped. That, that kind of private life doesn't exist anymore, I don't think. Yes? To what extent can or should the Times, uh, particularly internationally, uh, provide uh, and sell its news uh, in the way that AP, Reuters, and, and, and so on do? Uh, we have a news service which does that. Now, we'll never be as large or as complete as AP <coughs> or Reuters, uh, but we already do that. We're, our stuff is sold around the world with our actual names on it, which is a refreshing change for us. But then they're buying it, and they're buying the name, too. Yeah. One more question. Thank you for the article in yesterday's New York Times about Saranac Lake and uh, how the governor likes it up here. <laughs> oh, I wasn't responsible for that one. But uh, I have to say, when uh, I was driving up here, I, I, was, I haven't actually read the article yet. But I was wondering, well, is it really surprising that he likes it up here? I mean, it seems like the whole thing, well, I can't believe he's actually vacationing in New York. I think, well, it's really nice here. It's not like, it's, it's not like he's you know, vacationing in some dump somewhere and we're writing about it. Um, uh, well, thank you. And thank you very much for your hospitality. It's been wonderful. Thank you.